building model railroad scenery with the experts. Presented by Model Railroader Magazine. With Dave Frary, Malcolm Furlow, John Olson, Gordon Odegaard, Bob Hayden, and Jim Hedinger. It wasn't always this way. In the beginning, there was only this. We'll show you how to change it into a realistic scene by following the advice of experts. So this can be yours with a little work and practice. Scenery is more than just cosmetics. It gives our models a definite time and place. It creates a mood. It makes a model into a slice of life. And it improves the appearance of our models. But what does scenery look like? How can we get it to look like real life? Is a course in geology the answer? In Paleozoic times, three billion years ago, the Earth was composed of the seas and large vertical land masses. Now, in the Precambrian period, the water eroded the vertical land masses. 450 million years ago, in the Ordovician period, no, you don't have to go back to school to learn enough about geology to model scenery. Model railroading is supposed to be fun. But you do need to know enough about how the Earth came to be so you can model it effectively. Dave Furry is the author of the Kalmbach book, How to Build Realistic Model Railroad Scenery. I've always thought that studying something too much can take the fun out of it. Geology is not our hobby. Model railroading is. So we only need to know enough about geology to know how wind, water, and gravity affect everything. Wind, water, and gravity move everything from higher elevations to lower ones. Water flows from the tops of mountains, where it fell as rain and snow, to the oceans. Along the way, it picks up and deposits sand, soil, rocks, and even pieces of trees and vegetation. Wind moves loose sand and soil particles around, while gravity moves everything to the lowest possible level. Model railroads differ from the prototype because we like long tunnels. The prototype doesn't. We like long bridges. The prototype doesn't like long bridges. We like high mountains. The prototype usually seeks the lowest possible grade, usually water level. Usually, we lay track before we build the scenery. The prototype has to contend with scenery before the track is laid. Some other things to remember. Railroad civil engineers try to balance the amount of dirt they take from a cut with the amount needed for a fill. Retaining walls have to be used if there's a steep slope on a hill made of dirt. Now with this basic information, we're ready to move on to planning our scenery. The way I do it is with a clay model. This clay model is built three quarters of an inch equals a foot. Xerox paper copy is used of the track plan. Strip wood rises are used to show the track elevations. I use modeling clay to model the scenic contours. Any mistakes in scenery can be solved now before we get on to building our bench work, laying our track, and building our real scenery. Small wood blocks can be added to represent buildings. While planning, we need to think of what will be behind the layout and how we can hide the undesirable elements. That's where a backdrop is invaluable. It's best to plan now before the track is laid. There'll be more on backdrops later in the program. Now back to the scenery. Mountains and rocks add so much to a model scene that we have to know about them. John Allen couldn't have created these spectacular views on his Gorian defeated railroad without mountains. Notice his use of color. There are two types of rocks we need to know about, igneous and sedimentary. Igneous rocks were formed by molten lava forced to the Earth's surface millions of years ago. Sedimentary rocks were formed by layers of sand and silt that settled to the bottom of prehistoric oceans. These layers were compressed by their weight, and over long periods of time, they were squeezed into shales, slates, limestone, and sandstones that we know today. Rocks are not solid. They crack because of pressures from below, contraction, expansion, the effects of weather and frost, etc. We want our rocks and mountains to have faults, cracks, and other natural imperfections. Level ground is not really level. It rolls and undulates, and that's helpful for us hiding our long trains. Not every layout has to have mountains. 
Level ground and rolling hills are a welcome relief from layouts dominated by strong vertical lines, like mountains. Under these hills we find rock, but near the surface there are varying levels of clay and dirt. Remember that when it comes time to color the hills, we want some clay or dirt to show through. Trees, bushes, and weeds need soil and water, but they can also be found in dry deserts sticking out of cracks in mountains and rock cuts. All of this basic information is important when you're planning your layout. With the basics under our belts, we're ready to begin, but how? Malcolm Furlow is known as one of model railroading's great scenery artists. The first step in building convincing model railroad scenery is to build up the various scenic forms using the hard shell method. And these are the items that you will need. Torn strips of paper tally, masking tape, a spatula to mix the plaster with, bowl of water, a bowl to hold the uh, hydrocal. This is wadded up newspaper that we'll use to build up our initial landforms. And this is hydrocal plaster mixed in a mixing bowl. Hydrocal is dehydrated gypsum rock and is available at cement dealers and building supply yards. Okay, you want to begin by wadding up these newspaper forms. Just pile them up in an area that you want to build the terrain up in. Take the tape, tape it together, kind of hold it down because this is going to all be covered up later, or plaster. Take an atomizer spray of plain water, wet the area in the newspaper in the area that you want the plaster to stick to. These torn sheets of toweling are dipped directly into the plaster, wet both sides, kind of drag it off the sides of the bowl and just begin by laying these forms over. You don't have to be uh, neat, and this is a fun type situation. You macho men that have never got a chance to play in the mud before, it gives you a great chance to get your hands in something really messy. Once these things are applied, it takes about a oh, half hour or so for the uh, hard shell itself to set up. And then you can begin detailing it. Yeah, just drape this on there and blend it in, and that's all there is to it. And you've got a rigid base to work from later on. And that's hard shell. Two other popular methods are screen wire and styrofoam. Screen wire replaces hard shell as a support. It's harder to work with because the wire could cut and nick you and things like that, and it resists shaping a little bit more than the, uh, than the newspaper, but it gives the same result as the hard shell, a base for realistic scenery. Styrofoam is lighter and requires different working techniques. It too replaces the hard shell as a support. All the methods look about the same once the plaster covers them. Hey, that's beautiful, and you can have the same beauty on your layout. It's not as hard as it looks. There are two ways to do it carving and casting. John Olson is an expert at model rock work. Part of his job as a theme park creator involves making mountains. After we have the basic landform topography developed, we need to refer to our original plans and see just where it is we want the specific rock outcroppings to occur. When we get to this point, I like to use two techniques to build my rock work itself. One is this urethane foam, which I carve firsthand, and the other is this kind of molding plaster applied over the basic scenery shell. Let's take a closer look at this urethane foam and see just how we might want to use it. Carving it requires only one or two different knives. I prefer the common kitchen variety because it allows this kind of a cutting and tearing motion for the rock work itself. A stainless steel or other steel wire brush, which when dragged down the foam, leaves this eroded, washed out look and then a very stiff bristle brush. The basic landform, I like to use three types of rock work development. One is hand carved, and that would be used in areas such as this tunnel opening. The second area is up in this area here where you will find this blend, the transition between hard rock surfaces and hard rock surfaces. The third area is such as up here, this major mass form, is where we use latex rubber molds. I think this is a good point we can bring Malcolm in and have him show us how he develops his. Now what I'm going to do is show John how to do these latex molds because obviously he's been a long time carving these mm -hmm. landforms and I can show you how to do it very quick and very easy with latex rubber molds. Now what we're going to do is make a latex rubber mold off of a real rock. 
And so you could just find a rock that has sufficient strata. The material we use to paint onto this rock to make these latex rubber molds is this material I have here. And this material can be purchased at the hobby store, and it is a liquid rubber. You'll need a brush that is disposable, nothing that is very uh, expensive because we're going to have to toss this brush when we get through using it. We wet this rock. You have to uh, be sure that you get the rock sufficiently wetted so that this material will flow into the crevices. And what you want to do is paint this material onto the rock in various layers. And we're going to build up these layers, letting each layer dry before applying the next. It takes about 24 hours for this liquid rubber to cure. The third coat, apply this gauze material because that will keep the mold from tearing. As you apply this gauze here, just come back over with this, this uh, molding compound, this liquid rubber. The finished molds look something like this. Why don't we uh, mix some plaster Let up me get and, that for you. And I want to be sure and check what he's doing here and make sure he gets the consistency right. Mm -hmm. Because... You let me know how I'm doing, will you? Yeah, right, I'm going to make sure that you do it right. And John's made sure that the plaster is in a batter-like consistency. We spray and wet the mold with, with uh, water. And the water helps the, the uh, plaster in its liquid form flow into all the crevices of strata. What we want to do is make sure that we wet this area sufficiently for this plaster that we're going to apply it to adhere because dry plaster will readily soak up the moisture from the wet plaster. After anything from five to ten minutes, you'll find the plaster starting to uh, set up for you well enough to where you can apply it to the wall. And I test mine by picking it up and flexing it backwards. And see these little cracks here, kind of like the ones in the corners of your eye? Or your eye. Yeah. Uh -huh. These little cracks here will form across the surface. Uh -huh. That means that it's dry enough or stiff enough to put onto the wall. And we take the mold and simply Just tilt it up. Tilt it right on up. See, if you could tilt the mold without the plaster running out, then it's ready to go. And it's, it's just perfect. Right now, now, what I'm doing is pressing down the edges of the mold, making sure the plaster doesn't run out, kind of like the forms on a concrete pour job. What we'll end up with by this technique is a nice outcropping, a solid, substantial right. rock. Right. Something you won't have to carve on like you do. That's earlier. right. You're learning, aren't you? Yeah. And a good thing to do on these molds is kind of overlap these sections here, right here, where this goes together. So later on, it won't be such a problem in blending the castings together. These now have been sitting for about 10 minutes. And you can see as I peel this away. Plus they're warm to the touch. Yeah, they, they do give off heat on curing. You see how they do stick well. And look at this. Ooh, Beautiful. that came out nice. OK. We carve some of these areas here to to exaggerate the strata line on over to this particular area here. And I think what Malcolm's saying too, when you're working two formations together, go ahead and take the carving technique and continue some of the things that are happening from one right. rock to the other, which will like provide a little here. continuity. I take this solution and stipple all about the flat areas here. The thickness isn't so important as much as leaving us a medium that we can put a little texture into later on. At this point, we're looking for the stipple texture that the end of the bristles will give us. And what we're simulating with this is the soil or the gravel texture that the normal uh, scenery around the rock work would have. Is it true you're actually carving a rock, Malcolm? Uh, I'm just cleaning up some rough edges. Yeah. I don't want to go to the links that you went yes. to to carve a rock. Please don't. OK. OK, now that the plaster castings have dried, which takes about oh, uh, 30, 40 minutes, you want to begin slopping on the paint to make the thing look like a real rock. We have two products we both prefer. They're uh, quite a bit different in their application, but they're very similar in their uh, chemical content. Malcolm has these acrylic artist colors, and I use a universal tint or dye that is probably the material that's in Malcolm's paint to give it its color. We're going to wet the rock face to apply these water-soluble colors, but I uh, use yellow oxide, burnt sienna, and raw umber. And I just squeeze these colors out on a palette. I work from dark to light. I wet, wet the uh, rock surface just slightly. And apply this. This is an India ink that you can buy, Artist India ink. OK, I start just the other way from Malcolm. Uh, a little water on the rock, of course, and then move into the lightest colors and apply these with a brush fairly unevenly. You don't worry about total coverage. Okay. Coming back again with another color. 
burnt sand in this case. And you can see the layering that's happening, where one is covering some of the white, and, and it's covering some of the previously put on colors. Just take your brush. I use kind of a dry brush method, starting with this burnt sienna. Just apply it into the air. Just, just brush it on in a random fashion, such as this. Hit it with the water. It will flow into the crevices and rocks where you want it to go. Sometimes it's good to wet your brush a little bit with this water. Just squirt it right onto your palette here. Use a little of this yellow. You want to vary your colors in here. This yellow oxide. Maybe a little bit down in here. Just different areas. These universal tints, since they don't have a vehicle, there's no binding material in with them, you can take water, even after they've apparently set, and spray them. And notice how you can flood and move them around the surface. The last step in the process I'm showing you requires the water bottle at hand and a little of the black, which is very, very, get this around for you. It's very punchy. It can be dangerous. You can almost make it too dark too quickly. You take it straight out of the tube, this acrylic white. What he's doing is catching just the very top edges of the rocks, which simulates for us sunlight that we don't, of course, have indoors in our model railroad room. Uh, about all we could do is go on to our other modules and maybe show you what some of the rock work would look like in a finished sense once the foliage and vegetation is applied. Now we come to the part I like the most, turning the terrain into a real-life scene. John Allen was a master at this. Dave Ferry has devised a new method of adding texture. He explains the water-soluble method in his book, How to Build Realistic Model Railroad Scenery. This is ordinary earth-colored latex house paint. It's the basic coloring medium for the water-soluble method. The water-soluble method of scenery building allows us to do everything while the plaster, paint, and ground cover are wet. These are the materials we'll need. First, earth-colored latex house paint. White, flat white house paint. Brushes, acrylic matte medium, a spray bottle to apply the matte medium, various colors and textures of ground foam, and artist acrylic tube colors. These are used to further change the shades of earth. With the water-soluble method, we can build scenery while everything is wet. We can start here with plaster, which has just been applied and is still damp. Over this, we apply latex paint. The latex paint colors the plaster, and it also provides an adhesive to hold the ground foam. Now that we've covered the wet plaster with earth-colored latex paint, the next step is to apply ground foam. The way I do it is with a shaker jar. This is just an ordinary jar with some holes punched in the top. And the ground foam is sprinkled over the wet latex paint. I'm going to use another color. It's a little darker green. A way to apply ground foam to vertical surfaces is called whisking. And you can put the ground foam in your hand and actually blow it into the wet paint. Now that we have on the basic textures, the next thing we want to do is wet down the ground cover. This is so that the ground cover will accept the next layer of foam. This is an ordinary spray bottle with water. The water has a little bit of household detergent added to it, about two drops of detergent to 32 ounces of water. Now we're going to take a clean brush and move the foam away from the areas where we don't want it. In this case, there's some foam that fell onto the track. I'm also going to add some rock texture. This is sifted builder's sand. This is going to be added along the side of the rail just to vary the color and to provide a little bit of texture. Now we have some brown ground foam. This is acrylic matte medium diluted with four parts water. Matte, acrylic matte medium is an artist's clear finish. We use it here as an adhesive to hold the ground foam in place. I thoroughly want to saturate the ground foam that's already in place with matte medium. You can keep applying matte medium until the foam almost turns white. This is a little coarser green foam, and it represents here nice green grass. 
Now we're going to add several lighter shades of green. These are going to be added to highlight the contour of the land. Here's how the scenery looks when it's finished the water soluble way. Okay, so now you've got all this great looking terrain with dirt, grass, and rocks, but something is missing. Trees, weeds, and bushes really bring a model scene to life. There's probably as many ways to make a model tree as there are trees in the real world. What we're going to show you here are some of the commercially available products, such as these in front of me, and also a range of natural materials. One of my favorite kinds of trees are these uh, pine trees that I use quite a bit on my own railroading in California. The first step is getting a hold of a piece of balsa wood such as this from the hobby shop. It's roughly a half inch square by eight to ten inches long. I use my own pocket knife and begin simply whittling the shape. Once we've finished carving the trunk, it'll have a, an uneven undulating surface on it such as this, which is a little bit of an advantage for us because it doesn't look quite so machine made. The next step is to add the texture to the bark. And I start with a piece of 40 grit common garnet sandpaper. At this point, we're ready for some paint and use common Liquitex acrylic artist colors and a little bit of water. Flow on almost in a stained manner so that you can get a little transparency. You can see through the paint. You get some of the white of the balsa wood is showing through. You can see how keeping the trunk wet allows the paint to flow and stain. Notice the color variations that occur within the trunk and these are from uneven application of the paint. The next step is the addition of the branches. And I prefer a, a variety of floral decoration called caspia. I'll use a little white glue and a needle and a stick to do the drill work, grabbing a piece of caspia with the tweezers dip it in the glue, and insert it in the hole. And break off anything that seems to either stick out too far or have a curl or a twist in it so it doesn't look natural. The next step, once all the glue is dried and all the pieces are securely attached, is to take some paint, and I prefer this uh, Pactra Earth Tone, and spray across all of these little buds. The one thing we don't want to do is spray paint on our previously painted trunk, however. The next step is to add the greenery, the, what would we, we would call the pine needles. I use a couple of products here. One is the Tester's Velcoat Flattening Agent as the adhesive, and the second is ground rubber. And the way this is put on is by spraying the Velcoat onto the top sides of all of the little branchlets. And then we take the tree and rotate it slowly as we sprinkle over the ground sponge. I think you can see the range of color, size, and age lends a lot of interest to a scale model scene. There's also an easy and effective way to make some uh, nice low shrubbery growth, bushes and whatnot. I like to start by using some of the commercially available lichen. We're going to treat this as the basic tree structure and armature, and we're going to paint it to give it a little depth, a little shadow. This now becomes the armature upon which we're going to put the greenery. And let me put a good coat of gel coat on here. And then, as before, working over the container from which it came so we don't lose too much material, I simply sprinkle on, in this case, the darker of the two greens, shake the piece off a bit, apply a second coating of the adhesive, and then working from the lighter, maybe a little more yellow shade, just drop enough on that we pick up a little sunshine on the tops of the leaves. And on their own, they work out pretty well as little tree, or little bushes rather, chaparral type growth, but also, if you can find a tree armature, such as this piece of sagebrush that I use, you can use it by placing these bushes that we've made onto the armature and gluing them on generally with white glue, we can make a pretty effective looking oak tree. But something is still missing. It looks better than before. It looks like something we've seen, yet it's not quite right. There's no detail. Longtime model railroader Gordon Odegaard 
has made detailing one of his special interests. The late Len Westcott, editor of Model Railroader magazine, used to drink a lot of tea and throw the cold remains onto his scenery as a basic color. Tea really isn't a good method of covering track and roadbed, but let me show you a method that is. Model railroaders have always thought of the track ballast as part of track laying, but really it's a scenic element, and the finishing of the ballast ties the track and terrain together into a complete scene. To do this, you'll need a spray can of flat brown paint, an airbrush, rust and grimy black paints, ballast, paper cups, three by five file cards, a soda straw, a brush, matte medium for a fixative, a spray bottle full of water with detergent, an eyedropper, and an abrasive block for cleaning the track. As you can see, we've already colored this area, so we have a dry area to work the ballast into. But I'm going to show you what we did to prepare it. First, we took a spray can of flat brown paint and we sprayed the entire track and road bed. Next, we take an airbrush, and from a very low angle, we airbrushed the rails a rust color. If you don't have an airbrush, you can also use a regular brush. Just go along it like this and give it a rust color. Now we're ready to apply the ballast. We put it into a plastic cup, and we just gently go along and spread it like this. Not too heavy, just a light, even coat. Now we use a brush so that we can level out the ballast, and clear the tops of the ties so they show through. It's important that you get enough ballast to cover the edges of the ballast line and the road bed. It's important to keep the points and the throw bar of the turnouts free of ballast. To do this, place a white card against the rail to keep the ballast from getting in there. If you should get some ballast in the points, you can blow it out with a soda straw like this. When all the ballast is in place, we need to wet it with water and a little detergent in the spray bottle so that it will accept the matte medium that binds it in place. I use an eyedropper to apply it and just walk along it and apply matte medium to all the areas. You'll notice in this slide of a real railroad right-of-way that there's a difference between the main and siding tracks. To duplicate this on a model railroad, I use an airbrush and a gr thinned, grimy, black mixture of paint. I begin by spraying the track that is going to be the siding so that it is a little darker in shade than the main line. So that there's a difference in the coloration, the bright rust colored on the main line and a little darker shade on the rails. Now that we have the area completely colored, we need to add some details. We can put in a switch stand here or a power switch machine. We also have a relay case, a battery cellar, a telephone box, a speed sign for the train crews to see, and a line pole to carry the signals for the electronic equipment. Now that the track looks better, we need to add detail to give our scene some life. Included in our detailing materials are automobiles, figures, railway signaling equipment, line poles, electric light poles, animals, work trucks, rails, ties, and signs. Here's a model railroad scene as you normally see it when it's considered finished. It has all the elements of a model railroad, the structures, the roads, the track, the ballast, and the scenery. But we need something to bring it to life. This is the same area we started with, but all the details have been added to give some meaning and purpose to the area. Remember, you can move the elements around until they are in some logical arrangement. Now, if you're modeling a desert, you're done with the basic scenery. If you're modeling something other than a desert, you still have more fun in store. No, let's not get that chemical. We make our water with plaster, plastic, paint, and dye. Bob Hayden is one half of the Frary Hayden team of HON two and a half fame and a recognized expert at making water. Water is almost always a conspicuous feature of the landscape where railroads run. 
So you'll need to know how to model water effectively to make your layout scenery look good. This water, which is neither wet nor deep, does have the two features that model railroad water need. It reflects things and it looks good from above, which is your normal point of view. These are the tools and materials you'll need to build high gloss epoxy water on your layout. First, some paint for the bottom of the waterway, in this case, polyes earth and polyes grimy black. Next, some twigs and old tires to detail the bottom of the water. A roll of masking tape to make a dam along the edge of the railroad to keep the water from running onto the floor. Some paper cups for measuring. A two-part epoxy material. This one is called Envirotex, which is available in craft shops and used for making bar tops and coffee tables. A clean container in which to mix the epoxy, some tongue depressors to mix it with, a propane gas torch to get the bubbles out of the epoxy after it's poured, and some inexpensive brushes to manipulate the epoxy with once it has been poured. What I've done here in this river scene is bring the scenery and the color and the texture down to the banks of the river with standard scenic techniques. That done, I placed a masking tape dam across the edge of the railroad where the water runs off and poured in a soupy mixture of plaster to make a perfectly flat scenic base. After that had dried overnight, I'm ready to paint the scenic base with two colors, black for where the water is deep and tan for where the banks fade into the deeper water. And the color that you start with is black. This is poly -S, grimy black paint. The next job is to change the airbrush color to a, an earth color and feather the banks down into the deep parts of the river. And what you have is dark, murky depths here, and the water fades off and finally comes ashore, and you've got the banks. First step is to mix the epoxy. To do that, we take equal parts of the resin and the hardener and pour them into a mixing container. We stir the mixture vigorously with a tongue depressor or some other kind of clean stirring stick. You can see here that the details, such as a log and an old tire, have been added to the riverbed and the glue allowed to dry. Now we can pour the resin. And once the resin's in the riverbed, then you need one of these inexpensive brushes to move it up to the banks of the scenery and around the details. One of the interesting properties of this particular material is that if you pass a blowtorch flame over it while it's drying, all the bubbles will disappear. And there you have it. That stuff shouldn't be there. It ruins the mood and illusion we're trying to create. We need something to hide it all. At this point, let's begin with building our backdrop. I like to uh, prepare the backdrop backing board, in this case, quarter-inch masonite paneling, with a good coat, probably two or three coats if necessary, of flat white latex paint. This will give us a little vibrance, some action for the blue, which we're going to put on next to pick up light and bounce back. I'm going to use a two inch medium bristle brush and go for a complete coverage at the top end. And starting from the bottom, then we work towards the other blue that we just left. The darker blue here will represent the uppermost part of the backdrop. The light blue will give us the distance and the haze for the bottom end and work it up two, about two-thirds of the way up, then take the darker brush with a little fresh paint and work it backward down towards the light again. But this degree of streaking between the two different shades is really what I'm trying to achieve. Now, once these two colors dry completely, we'll go ahead and apply what I do in my next step, which is the printed cutout backing paper. This one, which has the sky already printed in part of the main piece, is one that can be used straight as it comes out of the box whereas I prefer another type a little more frequently, which is designed such that 
all of the two-dimensional scenery on it is made to be cut freehand from the rest of the backing paper. Once I found the proper location for the piece of artwork itself, that is, looking in at the scene from the three-dimensional side of the model and locating it so the proper sight line is established, I mark it on the backing board and then move the foreground scenery away, pick up the backdrop and fold it back over itself. Now, once this is flipped back over later with the glue on it, it's in the exact position we would like to have it in its finished form. I use common rubber cement. Now, there's two ways to uh, apply this. One is immediately, with both surfaces still wet, and what you'll have is a somewhat temporary bond. So if you ever want to remove it and reposition it, it'll be easy to do. Or let the fumes evaporate for a few moments, and once both surfaces are dry to the touch, flip it on over, and you'll have a, a more permanent bond. All of a sudden, we have a two-dimensional city. Now, the cleanup process, and it really is more important to let this dry more than we have here, simply involves taking a cement, rubber cement pickup. It's a piece of gummed rubber that, as it's pulled across the cement surface, will pick up and tease loose all the free pieces of the excess gum rubber. This is the back alley and wharf extension for my Jerome and Southwestern Railroad. It's an industrial area that has a backdrop incorporating many of the features that we've just discussed previously. I'm going to show you two things on this small segment. Pastel artist chalks are the simplest method for making smoke on backdrops. The beauty of using chalks isn't that they're so darn simple. All you do is simply approach the top of the stack in a scrubbing motion, move away. As the chalk wears off, it makes a nicer and nicer trail. Often, many of the occurrences on the two-dimensional backdrop can be useful for our 3D foreground scenery. And in this case, you'll see that as we move the train aside, a three-dimensional road in the foreground leads right into a two-dimensional road in the background. If, in fact, I hadn't wanted to take advantage of this occurrence and wanted to block out the background road, I simply could have inserted a 3D low-relief building such as this bas-relief to hide that from our view. A backdrop creates distance and illusion. We have to do both if we're going to be effective in creating a railroad in our limited spaces. That will do for a simple layout with no serious scenic problems. Few layouts are so lucky. I'll bet your layout has at least one of the following problems, if not more. Don't have enough space, you say? I'm sure you've heard people say it was done with mirrors. Well, that's exactly how Malcolm Furlow creates some of his illusions. You know, one way that you can expand the space on your layout is with the use of backdrops. And another way that you can do that very effectively, and it's a really a neat trick that I've learned on the Rio Chama, is with the use of mirrors. And you can see as I place this mirror at right angles to the track, it just seems to draw the track around and greatly expands the depth. You want to make sure when you place your mirrors in this situation that you always place the mirror where it is not viewed by the viewer in the aisleway, that is to say where his image is not reflected back to himself. This mirror and the line that it creates right here can be blended in a little bit more effectively by the use of paints and you can paint directly onto the mirror surface. Is you can actually paint on pine trees in this area in here to help draw the viewer's eye away from the parting line to hide the top portion of this mirror. Cutouts can be done out of cardstock and airbrushed in, feathered into the mirror, and you, it's hard to tell where the mirror stops and the scenery starts. And it's real easy to do, and there you have it. Many layouts reach this stage of scenic development. A lot of nice details, but no pizzazz. John Olson takes his scenes a step beyond. Scenic blending is a combination of techniques and processes that we often use to bring uniformity and reality into our model scenes. What I would like to do is show you a few examples here on my Mule Shoes Meadows diorama on just how I've taken these aging and weathering techniques and processes and applied them over different areas to bring together harmony within the scene, believability. You'll find all of these stains from oil, cinders, and ashes on the track. They also continue on out onto the planks of the turntable and then, of course, across the turntable on into the engine house. Well, what we try to do is tie together that heavy servicing look in one area, and then also balance away from it up here into the ash pit a grayer, drier look from the extinguished fires. And then across the track and up over here to the sanding tower, we'll find how we've dropped our other effect earlier and now added the spilled sand and possibly water stains while the tender was sitting there 
while taking on sand. Moving on up here into this water tank, you'll notice that the rust and accumulations of oxides have indicated to us another look other than the earlier previous industrial spillage. The same technique and the way we've blended it in with the scenery would then apply over here to the engine house roof with all the soot, grime, and grease that would accumulate as well as the birds and their ever-present droppings. All of this and these few examples tend to serve to show us how it is that we bring together the entire scene with an overall uniformity. A problem too many of us have is track on top of track. Usually the solution is a retaining wall or a sheer cliff. But Dave Ferrari has a novel answer. Stack track doesn't look right. It destroys the feeling that there are great distances separating the route our train is taking. To further expand this distance, I tried building the edge of a forest to hide this track. This is the edge of the forest effect. It's created by gluing lichen over twigs. These twigs were cut in the backyard and they were brought in and glued into the scenery with white glue. The lichen is glued over the twigs to create the illusion of a forest. Many different colors of lichen are used here to look like many different treetops. Lichen, by the way, is a fungus growth that's found in the Arctic regions of the world. It's sometimes called reindeer moss. By putting the forest between the two tracks, we effectively separate the lower track from the upper track creating an illusion of great distance between the tracks. With homes getting smaller and layout space diminishing, a new solution has emerged, two level layouts. This presents another problem, how to reach the second level. Jim Hediger found the answer for his Ohio Southern. With the double deck type of layout construction, the major portion of the layout is built like two complete dioramas that are stacked one on top of the other. The only portion of the layout where the two actually join is in this particular corner where we use the helix to con within a mountain to connect the two levels so trains can operate from one end of the system to the other. Now, the highest level of the layout is 20 inches above the lowest level, which is down where the freight yard is below me here. The two levels are connected with a 30-inch radius helix takes the trains in a stack pattern down through the mountain until they reappear on the lower level through the tunnel portal. This particular arrangement is not very realistic because the prototype trains do not go down through a mountain by going around four times. So this particular section of the layout is completely concealed with scenery so that in the lower yard all you see is the hillside. Now, eventually, the screen wire in the middle here will be entirely covered with the rough coat house plaster like we have on each side here. And then that rough coat plaster will be finished with the usual rock castings and carved rock and then the ground foam and other texture materials. Another problem every layout has is cramped quarters. Malcolm Furlow knows how to make the most of every available inch. You know, one of the real problem areas in constructing a model railroad is that you never seem to have enough room for the thing. And the way that I licked that problem on my home layout, the Denver Rail Chama Western, is I chose to build upward and downward rather than outward. You can see that the scenery stretches above eye level and travels down to the floor. The structures are even built along the canyon walls to achieve that space and depth. The track, as it spirals around, climbs along the canyon walls. It draws the eye inward into the depth of the canyon once again, making and having the viewer feel like he's in a larger area than he really is. As the mountains rise above eye level and even soar over his head, he has an actual feeling of being in a canyon. Here, too, the structures are built along the canyon wall, and the bridges and the foliage seem to add that depth to the scene. Here we see the scenery as it stretches upward above the viewer's eye, all the way up to the scenery in the lighting balance. The arch bridges in here help to soften the ruggedness of the scenery. And once again, it helps achieve a sense of depth and drama to the canyon area. Are you convinced now that scenery is not that hard and that it's a lot of fun? Scenery is something all of us can do. It's like everything else in model railroading. You can do as much or as little as you like. But above all, it must be fun. 
and it will be when your friends marvel at what a scenery expert you've become. Your railroad can look like this with a little work and practice. There seems to be some trouble here. Wiring can get you down if you forget the basics. Don't give up. Help is on the way with the basics of model railroad wiring. Presented by Model Railroader Magazine.